Thank you, brother. If you'll turn in the book of Acts to chapter 19, leaving his spirit till the work on earth is done. Uh, that's a great introduction to what we're thinking about here uh, because we're going to see the work of the Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, unusual miracles characterize the work of the Holy Spirit. And that brother who was just up here is a walking miracle. And, uh, and I pray he continue. He's an answer to our prayers. And uh, pray he continues to persevere and uh, continue in the song leading. It's, it's really a blessing to have him back in his role there. I know he had to have his moments of discouragement going through that whole ordeal. Uh, we all would be <laughs> discouraged. And, and a lot of us would give up and just say that, that but, but not him. That, that perseverance is a real testimony to the Lord. Well, we're looking here at Christ's great work in Asia. Now, when, we, when the Bible uses the term Asia, particularly in the book of Acts, it doesn't mean Asia like we think of it today, because today we think of the continent of Asia, which would include India, China, Russia, and the stands, you know, Afghanistan and Kyrgyzstan and all the different ones in between. That's all the uh, continent of Asia. In the Roman times of the first century, when this was written, Asia was just the western coastline of Asia Minor, which we call Turkey today. So the, the, just one of the provinces, but the prominent province of the section and Ephesus would be the main city. Now the three main cities in the Roman Empire in the first century, most of us know Rome, the imperial capital, number one, and secondly, Alexandria, the capital of Egypt. Alton's been there, and uh, it's not today near as prominent a city as it was then. And the third would be, and this would be in terms of size and population, Antioch in Syria, where Paul and Silas had been commended from. Now, Antioch today is almost, it's just ruins, basically. There isn't much there. But these were the three main cities, and you notice how they all connected to the Mediterranean Sea. Well, Ephesus would be further down the list in size and population, but in terms of economic status and status in the Roman Empire, it was a prominent city, right on the China Silk Route. From Ephesus, go all the way east to China, across the Himalayas and so forth. That was the ancient China Silk Route, and it ended, came west to Ephesus at the Aegean Sea. You would cross the Aegean Sea to Corinth, go across the Isthmus of Corinth, and then on to Rome, across the Adriatic. That's how it was done. That was the trade route. It was a main trade route. So this is significant that uh, the Lord leads the Apostle Paul to ministry here. Now you might remember over in chapter 16 in verse 6, remember, uh, and, and, and I'd like you to see that with your own eyes, when uh, they were on their second missionary journey, they thought they would be headed to Ephesus then. That's the Lord says through Luke, when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And someone says, well, if Ephesus is such a prominent city, why were they forbidden by the Holy Spirit to, to preach, to take the gospel there, right? Well, here we see the sovereignty of God and God's timing. God always had a plan for Ephesus. It would be the center of Paul's great work. After Antioch, Ephesus was the main center of the Apostle Paul's work in his years of public ministry. But you see, the timing. God knew when the people of Ephesus would be ready. And what a lesson that is to us when we share the gospel and we think of having a testimony in a particular region. We want God's timing. We want His sovereignty to be at work. We want to be submitted to Him. So this section began, we saw last time, that was a month ago, but in verse 18 of chapter 18. Acts 18:18 18, 18 really begins the section that goes all the way through chapter 19, verse 20. Okay, this is the section dealing with God's work in Asia. We already looked at verses 18 to 28 of chapter 18. 
But let me just review to set up where we're moving into chapter 19 here today. There were some good lessons we learned in chapter 18. We, in, in verse 18, Paul remained a good while. Luke has told us in verse 11 of chapter 18, he continued in Corinth a year and six months. Now, if you want to look at the timing in terms of the first century, that would be 50 A.D. to 52 A.D. That we kind of get the Lord, the, the church began in 30 A.D. And so about 20 years later, 50 to 52 A.D. was the year and a half he was there. And so verse 18 says he remained a good while and then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria because he had taken a vow. And I just want to come back to that thought for a minute because it shows the heart of the Apostle Paul and is an example to each one of us. You remember, we spent some time on this in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 18, the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus from heaven, encouraged Paul by telling him, do not be afraid, but speak and do not keep silent, for I am with you. <laughs> Now this is the second and not the last time the Lord from heaven would actually speak to the, to the apostle. Uh, remember he spoke to him in Acts chapter 9 when he at, at Paul's conversion. But here Paul had been involved in ministry. He had had some serious persecution in Philippi and in Thessalonica and in Berea. And then in Athens there was practically no interest there at the Areopagitica, we called it, the message that he gave at Areopagus. And now he's in Corinth, and again, he's encountering resistance at the synagogue. And it would be easy for him to get discouraged. We would all relate to that. And the Lord personally encourages him. And I believe what Luke is telling us, that on the, as a response to that encouragement, the Apostle Paul took a Nazarite vow. Now you say, that's in the Old Testament. That's correct. That's in Numbers chapter 6. But Paul, remember, was rooted in the Old Testament. And it would not be wrong, because it's biblical, if someone today, if someone is a born-again Christian, even if they weren't Jewish, wanted to take a Nazarite vow, in my view, that would not be wrong, as long as they explain why they're doing it and so forth. It was a temporary vow. They wouldn't cut their hair. It was a man, he wouldn't cut his hair, in purposely to be a shame for the Lord, and he wouldn't go near anything dead, and he wouldn't touch anything that was the fruit of the vine for some period of time at his own choosing. Whether it was a week, or four weeks, or a couple of months, whatever that would be, it's totally voluntary. And it was a voluntary response to God's love for that individual. So Paul understood the Lord's love for him and his personal care for him, and he apparently decided to take this Nazarite vow. Now, of course, the Apostle Paul, being the true Jewish person that he was, according to the vow, when you, when you finish with the, time, the days of your vow, you cut the hair and you take it to the temple and you offer it to God at the bronze altar. That's all described in the book of Numbers. So Paul had a determination to go to Jerusalem to do this. This is amazing to me. Because the Lord has encouraged him. He says, I have many people in this city in Corinth. And there was a tremendous work going on there. But Paul doesn't get so absorbed in the work of God that he misses the relationship with God. You know how we can sometimes get so busy in the work of God that we forget about a relationship with God. And the relationship with God is what enables the work and enables it to be fruitful. And Paul got that. I think that's what he's demonstrating here. And the Lord let him do it. He, he's determined. And so in chapter 18, he came actually to Ephesus in verse 19 with Aquila and Priscilla. And uh, he left them there. He didn't go, reasoned with the Jews in the synagogue on one Sabbath. They wanted him to stay longer. Here's an open door, Paul. You want to go to Ephesus back in chapter 16. Now here's an open door. But he says, no, I made this vow. I'm going to complete it by taking the cut hair. He cut his hair at St. Korea in verse 18. And I'm going to take it to Jerusalem and offer it at the bronze altar. <laughs> and he did. 
And, and then after he was in Jerusalem, uh, verse 22, and he had finished it, 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 Caesarea and Caesarea, gone up and greeted the church. That would be the church in Jerusalem. He went down to Antioch, his commending assembly, where, they, where the work started. And after he had spent some time in Antioch, he departed and went and began, verse 23. I don't know if your Bibles note this, but you might make a note of it. This is the beginning now of his third missionary journey. He said one, two, this is its third one. And he begins it from Antioch, just like the previous two began at Antioch. He moves westward over the region of Galatia, where he went in his first and second missionary journeys in Phrygia in order. And what was his purpose? The end of verse 23. Strengthening all the disciples. <laughs> So Paul had this pastoral heart that all the places where he had been and planted churches were young believers, right? They'd been believers for only a few years. And Paul has this heart to go back there and to strengthen them. And, and this word, is, it's a pop, popular word with Luke. He uses it, I think, three or four times in Acts. And, and it's the idea of a fence when it kind of gets leaning because of winds and hurricanes. I had a fence like that in Houston. And, and you'd have to prop it up, right? And it's the idea of holding up, strengthening. Well, it was already there, but it just needed bolstering and strengthening. You, you ever been there? <laughs> I've been there. Well, you just need the Christians to come along and strengthen you. This is part of the relationship that we have in the Lord. It's tremendous ministry of encouraging and edifying, those are biblical words, right? Edifying one another. And then we saw the story that then it just so happens, the Holy Spirit guiding the mind of Luke as he's writing this, he includes this story about Apollos in verses 24 to 28. And we looked at that already. Fascinating story of an individual from Alexandria. He knew the scriptures, this would be the Old Testament, he vigorously defended the fact that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of the Old Testament. But he didn't totally understand what it meant to be saved, particularly in the aspect of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, you see. And so Aquila and Priscilla notice this. This is in verse 25. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. You say, well, how can that be? Well, John the Baptist had a ministry, a baptism unto repentance, that, that he did for six months before the Lord came to him. And there were, he, there were disciples of John the Baptist. We read about them in the Gospels, right? And they apparently went out into the regions of the Roman Empire. We're going to meet some more of them here in chapter 19. And so Luke includes this story of Apollos to set us up for chapter 19. You see how masterly it's all woven together? The mind of God. And so Aquila and Priscilla, when they heard him in verse 26, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And this, the lesson here is what we call today shared ministry. Shared ministry. That we all have a role to play in the body of Christ, right? It's not just those that are involved in platform ministry that are the ones supposed to be doing all the work. Now, everyone has a role to play and they can be involved in strengthening disciples of the Lord. And there are people that you have contact with that I don't ever know. And there are people I have contact with that you don't ever know. We all work together in this. So Aquila and Priscilla heard him and recognized there's something here he's not totally getting about the gospel. And he hadn't, if all he knew was the baptism of John. He hadn't totally understand. John came and announced the Lord Jesus. He was the forerunner. And so he, the other thing we learned from Apollos is meekness, which is a great characteristic of born-again people, right? Part of the fruit of the Spirit is meekness. The Lord said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Someone who's meek is teachable. 
is willing to learn, admits they're not know-it-alls. <laughs> They're willing to learn, you see. They're willing to accept. And Apollos demonstrated. He was, uh, Luke describes him, eloquent, man, mighty in the scriptures. And yet he was willing to learn from this couple who had worked with Paul. And because of working with Paul and been learning from the apostle Paul, they understood the gospel completely. Apollos needed some correcting here, and they were willing to help him, and it furthered his ministry for the Lord. So it was a success all the way around. Aquila and Priscilla got to minister for the Lord, and Apollos gets furthered along, and Aquila and Priscilla are happy to take the background in the whole thing. Paul will give him enormous credit in Romans chapter 16. He knew that this couple was used, and, and they go with Paul to Ephesus. We saw that already. So they're already there in Ephesus when Paul gets there. So in the midst of all of this, Paul arrives in Ephesus. Chapter 19, verse 1. So you notice chapter 19, you could have put the, the chapter break at verse 18 of chapter 18, I think, because chapter 19, 1 just continues the previous story. So it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. So here he is. You almost want a drum roll as he moves into here because the, the, the kind of ministry for the Lord that's going to go on here at Ephesus for three years. Tremendous. And great example to us of what godly ministry looks like. So who does he encounter first? Finding some disciples, he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now here I would credit Paul. Paul had several gifts of the Spirit. Here would be the gift of discernment. Whatever Paul heard from them or observed in them, these were 12 men that were also all they knew was the baptism of John. They were devoted to what they knew, but they had limited understanding, right? And we can encounter people like that. We encounter people in the workplace like that. We encounter people in our neighborhood like that. Sometimes the Lord brings people into the chapel that we can minister that way. They don't have the full understanding of what the gospel is about. And this is characteristic of the gospel, the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We were just singing about that. Characteristic of new covenant ministry. 2 Corinthians 3, Paul talks about you are ministers of the new covenant. And part of being ministers of the new covenant is living according to the Holy Spirit and serving the Lord according to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is essential. Now, in, in our circles, we have to admit that maybe we have overreacted to the charismatic movement because of certain extremes that we've seen in the charismatic movement that go beyond what the Word of God says. But sometimes in an overreaction, we can pull away, go to the other extreme, and ignore the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and that would be quenching the Holy Spirit, which we're forbidden to do, right? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. So there's an important balance here. Now the Holy Spirit's ministry is not to magnify the Holy Spirit, right? Because the Lord told us in the upper room in John 16 that the ministry of the Holy Spirit was to magnify whom? In the, in the Trinity, Jesus. He will speak of me and he will glorify me, the Lord said to the eleven in the upper room. And this is what we see as a characteristic of Holy Spirit, true Holy Spirit ministry. And the ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to be prominent all the way through, particularly in this section, verse 20 of chapter 19. And he's going to be contrasted with the ministry of evil spirits. Because Ephesus, being a capital of commerce, because of being on a major trade route, right? Another characteristic of Ephesus was that they housed the temple of Diana, or Artemis, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world along with the Pharaoh's lighthouse in Egypt and the Colossae and Colossal and so forth. But 
We have the, it's one of the seven wonders. And along with that, there was an enormous fascination with magic and sorcery in the dark world in Ephesus. Now, the Holy Spirit knew that. I don't know if Paul knew that before he came there. It likely was something that a lot of the people in that region would have known. So first he encounters these disciples of John the Baptist. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And so they said to him, we have not so much as even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Now that doesn't mean they didn't know the existence of the Holy Spirit because the existence of the Holy Spirit is in the Old Testament. And John the Baptist himself said in his messages that we have in the Gospels, right, that when the Messiah comes, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, remember? So he even had it in his message. And it was promised in Ezekiel 36 and in Jeremiah 31 when the new covenant came that the Lord would give the Holy Spirit to those who had trusted him. But they haven't heard that there's a ministry of the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of believers. And you wouldn't get that from the ministry of John the Baptist, right? Even what we know of him, what we have recorded. So they're being honest. And so Paul says to them, into what then were you baptized? So they said, into John's baptism, just like Apollo's. Then Paul said, John indeed, now notice how tender Paul is and how respectful he is. He doesn't pounce on them. He doesn't hammer them with this. He just carefully explains the truth. John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who should come after him, that is after John, that is on Christ Jesus, Messiah Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. You see, the heart was prepared. Immediately, they responded. They said, well, Christ Jesus is the fulfillment? They didn't know. They, had, they probably had been in the Palestine area during those six months when John was announcing the Lord. And then when the Lord came and was baptized, maybe they weren't there. Maybe they'd already gone to Egypt or gone to Ephesus as they traveled around. Maybe they were in business or something, probably were, where there had to be some traveling. So they'd missed out on this. Did you know yourself, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, that you received the Holy Spirit the moment you trusted in him? That's important to know. Remember, Paul told these same Ephesians in Ephesians 1, 13, having believed, you were sealed for how long? Forever, right? With the Holy Spirit of promise. And he comes to indwell us the moment we believe. Not at our water baptism. Not at some confirmation thing that follows after that. No. According to the Bible, the moment you trust Christ, you are sealed, baptized by the Holy Spirit. Baptized into Christ and into his body, the church. That's the biblical baptism of the Holy Spirit. So when they heard this, they were happy to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now someone says, well, you mean they didn't follow the baptism formula that, that the Lord gave on Matthew 28? It's supposed to be the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, of course, it was that all three persons of the Godhead were mentioned. But the emphasis here is the Lord Jesus. That's who they didn't recognize that he was Messiah. They didn't know that. The Messiah had come. <clears throat> and the one that they'd been looking for with the baptism of John, he had already come. And then we see something also unique in verse 6. When Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Now this is important to see in its context, right? Is that there are some today that tell us that that's when you receive the Holy Spirit. That you don't receive the Holy Spirit when you believe in the Lord. And you don't receive him maybe at baptism. But you receive him in some second great work when some preacher or some group of elders lays their hands on you. And they use this verse. But is that an accurate handling of this? I would say no. And this is why. So we want to be able to defend it from the word of God. There are two occasions in the book of Acts... 
The other one occurred in chapter 8, you might remember, remember, when Philip had gone to Samaria and there were a lot of people in the, in the town of Samaria that had come and received the Lord Jesus and then it wasn't until Peter and John went there and laid hands on them they, they received the Holy Spirit. Why did the Lord do it that way? Well, we believe the best way to explain that is to affirm the apostleship of, in the chapter 8, Peter and John, here, of the Apostle Paul. In other words, the Apostle Paul's identification and these 12 men identifying themselves with Paul and his ministry is affirming that they are together with the apostles in the work they were doing, which was proclaiming the gospel. And some believe, including Dr. Bruce, and I think you can make a good case for it, even though the text doesn't clearly say it, that these 12 men were likely foundational to the work that, that, was, that occurred there in Ephesus. Because from Ephesus, the three years that Paul was there, a little over two years, the whole region was evangelized. All of the seven churches we read about in the book of Revelation were probably all planted at the time of this great work. Colossians, the Colossian church was, was just down the road in Hierapolis and Laodicea and all these other churches were begun at that time. There was a tremendous work of evangelism and edification that follows evangelism that took place. So they're identifying with the Apostle Paul. Now, I remember that, that uh, when I was first commended to the Lord's work in May of 1998, the elders laid hands on me in the assembly where I was there in Houston. And, and I was glad for that. I mean, I felt it. Uh, two of them with their hands on, on my head, actually, and the other ones just had their hands out. But I liked the touch part of that. But did I receive the Holy Spirit then? No. Did, did I feel any sort of special outpouring then? No. But I did feel a sense of affirmation and commitment to encouraging me and the work that the Lord had called me to do. They were saying, they were, there was an identification going on, right? They were saying, look, we believe the Lord has called you. And that's why I didn't go back to engineering. I could have at that point. We believe the Lord has called you to go out and to serve and to trust him. And that was what, 24 years ago. And he's, I can tell you, looking back, he's totally taken care of me. Most of you know me, you know that taking care of the clothing on my back, taking care of my where a residence to live in, to, a vehicle to drive. Uh, but when I left engineering in August of 1995, that was the end of paychecks. That was the end of vacation pay. How would you like to go without vacation pay? No more vacation pay, no more sick pay, no more payment for insurance. All right, how would you like that? Not to have your insurance result. No insurance. And what was ahead? Question mark. No, it was all in the Lord's hands. I didn't know, but I knew him in whose hands it was. The Lord, see. So these men were identifying with the Apostle Paul and his work. And this is why, because this doesn't repeat. You can't say that all of the either Jewish or Gentile believers from here on out, this doesn't happen. They don't speak with tongues when they're saved and they don't speak with tongues even after they're saved with some sort of outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That just isn't there. And if you look at the epistles that are written, most of them by Paul, it's not there in the epistles either. So if it was something that was a characteristic of the New Testament church, then the Holy Spirit has not communicated it in the Holy Word of God that way. He's given us these two unique examples after Pentecost where this occurred, where it was like a Pentecost experience. So you have Acts 2, Pentecost, Acts 8 at Samaria, Acts 19 here in Ephesus. It's unique. It's something the Lord did in a unique way. And then Luke adds in verse 7, now the men were about 12 in all, which is kind of interesting too, because they're 12 Jewish men. And how many apostles did the Lord have? 12 Jewish men. And how many tribes were there in the nation of Israel? 
How many people do they put in the jury box today? Twelve. I don't think they're doing that to follow the Bible or to follow God, but it is the number of testimony or administration in, in God's economy. And I think it'll continue to be in the millennial kingdom. And so Paul, verse 8, he goes into the synagogue and speaks boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God. Now, this is what we have seen is this pattern at every town. If there is a synagogue there. Now, a few of the towns he came to didn't have synagogues, so he didn't do that. But if there's a synagogue there, he goes there first. Now, why does he do that? A couple of reasons. One is because, as he tells us in Romans, the book of Romans, the gospel, God has obligated himself to take it to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And how did God obligate himself to do that? Well, in Genesis chapter 12, he made promises to Abraham, and Abraham was the beginning of the nation of Israel. Right? Isaac, Jacob, the 12 sons. That's the nation of Israel. And so the Lord, he made a covenant. He had covenanted himself with Abraham. And that's, it doesn't mean that the Jew is his favorite, because the Bible is clear, there are no favorites with God. There's no favorite nation. It doesn't mean he's his favorite. God isn't like that. People are like that. There's no favoritism with God. But God began the nation through Abraham that Messiah, his son, would come from, come through. And Israel was that nation, you see? And so that's why God obligated himself to take the gospel to the Jew first, also to the Greek or the Gentile. There's a second reason, and it's more practical. It makes sense if you're going to give the gospel to give it to people who already know the Bible. Right? <laughs> so in the synagogues, these people would be steeped in the Old Testament, which is the Bible in that day. The New Testament still being written. So to, take the, to say that the Messiah has come is to go to Old Testament scriptures and people that knew the Old Testament would be more likely, you would think, it didn't happen that way, right? But they would be more likely to respond to the truth of the message. Messiah has come. The Messiah that's been talked about since Genesis 3.15 in the days of Adam and Eve. Well, he's finally come and Jesus is his name. And he dwelt among us there in Palestine. And did miracles. So that was the gospel message that Paul gave. And he quoted Old Testament scriptures. We see that from the example Luke gave us in chapter 13. To validate from the Old Testament that Jesus is the real Messiah. He's not an imposter. Like the Jewish leadership had said in that day. And like they still say today. And what would be the response you would think would happen? And you'd think, you'd think they'd be jumping for joy. Messiah has come. Now, they hadn't been in Palestine, these people in Ephesus. And unless they were on trade routes where they would hear about it, they probably hadn't even heard a lot of what had happened. Paul's describing to them. But as we see often in, New, in the New Testament, some were hardened. Verse 9, did not believe. And then not only that, they spoke evil of the way. You see that? The Christianity in that day was called the way. The way of what? The way of Christ. The way of God. I love that. It was just called the way. It had already come to be known that way. And they spoke evil of the, the way of God before the multitude. So what did Paul do? He departed from them, withdrew the disciples, and continued to the work, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Now this is in the New Testament the first great discipleship school. I, I don't know why, even in church history, I haven't talked to Frank, he might be able to help me with it, but I've never known any discipleship school to take that name. Now they took Galilee here, but they could have easily said Tyrannus, the school of Tyrannus, right? Following the pattern of the Apostle Paul here, not that Galilee would be wrong, because our Lord did that there too. But I just think it's interesting because Paul spent two whole years, can you imagine, reasoning daily from the Word of God. Now, the school of Tyrannus, apparently he had a lecture hall, this Tyrannus, 
And like, like Dr. Bruce says, uh, he does, he's, it's interesting to think about who named him, because Tyrannus means tyranny, right? And, or sovereignty. And this man, did his parents name him that, or did his students name him that? That he was this, like... <laughs> A tyrant, you know, in his teaching. But he would teach in the morning hours, and then the custom, we wouldn't know this from the Bible, okay? But in, we understand from history in that day, secular history, that they took a siesta. Now, in America, we don't take a siesta. You know what a siesta is, right? A two hour time, uh, usually two, sometimes three hours, from noon to two or three o'clock in the afternoon for, for a rest. And then, they, of course, they would work later into the evening. They'd probably work till 8 o'clock to make up that difference. Now, in Latin countries, that, that is still very much part of their culture. I remember being at a uh, conference with, with a bunch of uh, Bible teachers in Dallas. And we had a couple there from Latin America. And I remember after lunch, he said, bye. I, Where are you going? He said, I'm going for my siesta. And he found a classroom somewhere in the building. And I, I was looking to see if I could find where he went. I never could find him. But, uh, and, and the conference course in, in our culture, the conference begins at 1 o'clock sharp. You're back there. You've got to get back in there and get ready to take notes. It was an all-day conference. But he's going to take his siesta. That's the way it is. And well, they, did, they did that there. They still do that in parts of Europe, I'm told. I, I think it's a wise thing because it makes you fresh for the second half of the day. But... That's a cultural thing, right? So Tyrannus would teach in the morning hours and take his siesta. Paul was able to use the, the hall of Tyrannus in the afternoon. So Paul probably did his tent making, working with making the tents that he was doing in the morning hours. And then he would lecture, if you will, or teach or reason from the word of God daily in the school of Tyrannus. And Luke says, and this continued for two years. So that how many who dwelt in Asia? What's the word there? All. All who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Now this went on from 53 to 55 AD, if you're following your timeline. 53 to 55, and at this particular time is when 1st and 2nd Corinthians was written. During this time in Ephesus. And we'll look at that probably next time, some links in those letters that tell us about to this occasion. So he continued to do this. And look at what God did in verse 11. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. That's why I say I think this is an unusual miracle we have sitting right here because I don't know very many people that went through that many days on a ventilator and even survived, let alone be back in their ministry singing. And, and I rejoice in that. I rejoice. It's a victory for God, beloved, isn't it? It's a victory for God and, and answered prayer and trust in Him. But God, beloved, He still works unusual miracles, doesn't He? Anyone that's born again is an unusual miracle. <laughs> To go from darkness to light is a miracle. Don't you agree with me? To go from death to life is a miracle. And we need to be focused on this and realize that God has still got the power to do it. You have not because you ask not, James says, because you're not willing to ask in prayer. Or you ask for the wrong reasons, for the wrong motives, James says. For selfish motives. But God worked these, un un and so, so Luke's going to tell us. Uh, just, he's just going to give us a little window. I mean, I would have loved for him to go on a couple of pages about this, you know, what, what the, these unusual miracles look like. But so that even handkerchiefs or aprons, now he would, handkerchiefs is really a sweatband that he wore probably on, on his head as he worked in tent making. He wasn't in air conditioning, of course. And, and the aprons would, he would wear to, to protect his clothing while he's working in, in that work. They were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, the evil spirits went out of them. Now I've heard some on television, the, these charismatic ones that, that want to still do that today. They preach with a handkerchief, and then they'll, they'll mail it to you for healing, and that kind of, if you give them money. And they will use these verses here. But... I think that's being perhaps a little presumptuous, number one. And number two, we have the, the Lord, we have the Holy Spirit. We don't need handkerchiefs from somebody that may or may not be a true Bible teacher anyway. 
may be a charlatan. If we don't know them personally, we should be investigating those things. But this was, this was fantastic. They would, God was affirming the work in spectacular ways. Now things like this happen in times of revival in church history. It's an amazing study that, you know, there, there were towns in New England during the Great Awakening. I've read on this, so that's the only reason I know about it. In 1738 to 1742, the time of Jonathan Edwards, I've been to the church there in, in Massachusetts, my home state, where all this happened. And, uh, and there was such a turning to God in revival in the town that all the places of ill repute and all the saloons shut down because no one was going there. <laughs> the whole town came under conviction. People that were alcoholics, people that were involved in all kinds of other evil trade were, were totally convicted by the Holy Spirit and came to Christ. That's what happens in times of revival, similar to what's happening here in this story in Ephesus. Can this happen? In this region of South Louisiana, it sure can. Do you pray for it? I pray for it. Does that mean it's going to happen just because we pray for it? No, because that's always in the sovereignty of God. And we submit that to God. But we have not because we ask not, right? So why not ask? Why not when we recognize more people come to Christ and come to salvation and eternity in heaven in time of revival than any other time? In history. That's what's happening here. But as was common in times of revival, so also here, the evil one will try to imitate the things of God. And so we have this fascinating story about these seven Jewish exorcists. Verse 13 Some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists. Note this, took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. Now these people, they weren't believers. They were just calling on the name. They had heard it like it was a magic potion. They could call on it and it would work, right? Saying, we exercise you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. See, they had heard Paul do it. They'd seen all these miracles happen because of Paul. So they thought they could hijack this for their own use, just like cheap imitators want to do today. And so they were these seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the evil spirit, that they came to a man who was demon possessed, the evil spirit answered from this man and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? <laughs> Now, if you walked in and proclaimed the Lord Jesus, would the devil, would the devil, would the demon know who you are? Would they know who? I hope they would. I hope you'd have enough of a testimony for the Lord that the demon would be frightened of you because of being a prince or a princess of the king, a child of the king and empowered by the Holy Spirit and coming with the boldness and confidence of the Lord. I love this. He, the demon knew who Jesus was. And the demon knew who Paul was. But he knew these people were fake pretenders. So what did he do? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them. Remember, one against seven. And prevailed against them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. I'll bet they fled. And again, this is characteristic of demonic ministry we see today even. The devil is always wanting to humiliate men and women because he hates men and women, right? He was the anointed cherub and he thinks he should be the one controlling the earth and he has temporary reign of the earth now under the Lord. But he, nudity is always connected to demonic work because it's again a humiliation. So the whole pornographic industry is connected to demonism. The whole false idolatry connected to demonism. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 10. The whole child sex trafficking thing that's coming out with uh, Judge Jackson and all of that now that, that is, is prominent. It's more prominent in this world than we'd like to admit. 
and, and doing and exploiting and torturing children, videoing that so that people can watch that for pleasure. That's demonic. That's not of the Holy Spirit. That's of a spirit, all right, but not the Holy One, an evil spirit, see? And so these seven went, you know, it, it, was, it was enough just to run them off, right? He didn't, but he beat them, wounded them, and then removed their clothing, and then they ran off like that. In other words, they were humiliated. They didn't get any victory here because they didn't know the Jesus whom Paul preached. I hope you do. I hope you know the Jesus whom Paul preached. Because, you know, we've talked about it some, the whole Hollywood movie industry, it's, it's totally given over. I mean, they, they were showing it on the plane uh, yesterday coming over. Matrix, I thought that was 20 years ago, right? 22 years ago, it's back. Uh, they've got a new Matrix movie with the same actors, you know. Uh, Keanu Reeves is back in it and so forth. And, and it, it, it's weird. I mean, what, that whole thing, it's totally demonic. And a lot of these, these uh, superhero movies, it's totally demonic. And if you expose yourself to it, you're going to open yourself to demonic oppression. As a child of God, you can be oppressed, not possessed, but you can be oppressed temporarily. You don't want that. It's no good. This is what demons want to do to you, or worse, right? So the whole area of self-destructive behavior is linked to demonism. And self-destructive behavior would be addiction to alcohol, just a slow form of suicide, or drug addiction, a slow form of suicide, or suicide itself, and playing around with that. Now, all connected to demonism. So here in this great work where the Holy Spirit's working, here we see Luke records this story of people trying to imitate, not a born-again Christian, but trying to imitate because they recognize the power in the Lord Jesus. But what was the response of the community? Verse 17, this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. I'll bet the story went out. And what was the response? Fear fell on them all. That's one part. And secondly, the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. That's what we want. That's where the victory is. That's where the overcoming is. I was talking to someone down in Florida this week that was struggling with, uh, she just got saved and she's getting baptized. And she said she's having all kinds of terrible thoughts and, and waking up with bad dreams. And, you know, what do I do? Take downs. I gave her certain scriptures to have handy. You either write them out on a card, have them near your bed, or have them marked in your Bible. She just, she just got saved. She doesn't know where the things in the Bible are. And when you wake up, come to these verses and read them out, and then call on the Lord Jesus out loud by name, if it helps you, and you'll get victory. There's power in the name. Amen? Amen? There's power in the name. And we have not because we ask not. We don't ask Him for help when we need the help. And... Look at verse 18. Many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. And they have here this, what I call the, the great bonfire of Ephesus. Look what happened. And many of those who had practiced magic brought their magic books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they continued up, counted up the value of them, totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. Well, one piece of silver was a day's wage. So if someone makes $12 an hour for an eight-hour day, that's $96, right? So we'll call it $100 a day. That's $5 million worth of books. It's pretty amazing. That's in a bonfire. I had a bonfire. A few years after I got saved, to get rid of the, the rock albums and get rid of some of the books I had that I got in college on Carlos Castaneda and all that sorcery junk and just burn them because I, I, was, I didn't even want to put them in the trash container and have someone accidentally get them out of the trash and be defiled by them. If you burn them, they go to ash and they can't hurt anybody else. And maybe some of us need to have a bonfire. Maybe, you know, we need to get rid of some of these things in our lives. But this was the work of the Spirit of God. They were confessing. They were willing to admit how the Lord had set them free. 
And Luke concludes in verse 20 with a summary statement. So the word of the Lord did what? Grew mightily and prevailed. Prevailed against all forms of evil. Prevailed against all the obstruction that the Jewish people may have, or even Gentiles might have brought. And the word of the Lord still needs to be magnified and prevailed. Amen. We still want that here at Southside and in Lafayette and in Southern Louisiana. And let's be praying that. Let's be asking the Lord. It's the same Lord working today. And so, Father, we thank you for your, your word and for the encouragement we see here in this town of Ephesus, in a land long ways away from what we know about. But we can relate to the cultural situations there. And it's the same devil doing his work to distort and discourage. Lord, we want to live on the place of prevailing in victory by your grace in the name of the Lord Jesus. Help us to do so. Take us all home safely, we ask. We thank you again for today. In the Lord Jesus' name we pray.